Hello, Malcolm Brady here from Dublin City University. Today I'm going to talk to you about um, decision making, um, organisational decision making, and some of the things that can go wrong with organisational decision making, in particular escalation of commitment and groupthink. So we're going to talk about those kind of concepts today. I'm um, going to start with a case study on organisational decision making, and there's the one by Graham Allison on the Cuban Missile Crisis, well known paper, uh, 1969 paper. <clears throat> And it's very well known. And he, he looked at decision making in this context. And what he found is that it was much more complex than he first thought, or than would one would first think. And um, he, he looked at it from three particular modes or lenses, as he called them. And um, the first one is, is the, what he called rational policy, or we would tend to know it as rational choice. And we've been through this already in, a, in the previous session, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. But essentially, uh, it talks about a situation where much is known. You know uh, your, your preferences over various outcomes. You know what the outcomes may are, are or what the available outcomes are. You have some basis for making a choice over those outcomes, pros and cons, costs and benefits, advantages, disadvantages. Some, you can carry out some calculus to work out the different outcomes, and then you make a choice. Uh, based on some utility function, the best outcome, you know, the best in your cost benefit analysis where the ones where the net gain is, is greatest, let's say that could be your, your choice function. <clears throat> um, he makes an interesting point that uh, others don't necessarily point out what he does, and it's that the decision maker in this case is seen as a unitary decision maker and there is a single entity. And if we think about it like Brexit, if you take Brexit as an example, Britain there is seen to be the decision maker. Britain leaves the EU or Toyota launches a new um, car or America begins a trade war with China, that sort of thing. Okay, as though America can do that or Britain can do that or Toyota can do that. Each of those are some kind of fiction. Uh, Toyota's a legal entity uh, largely. Uh, Britain is, depending on how you look at it, um, um, an island with mountains and rivers and lakes or a political entity or whatever, but it, it's not a decision maker, okay? Uh, decisions are made by people, but it's as if under the rational choice uh, approach, it's as if the decision is made by the major entity, okay? Now he goes on to the organizational process um, approach, which he says is really um, that there isn't really a single unitary decision maker. Um, there's a loose constellation of various organizations that are involved in this decision process. And these organizations are separate entities, as in, you know, they're involved in decision. It might be within the one umbrella organization, as in the Cuban Missile Crisis situation, but they're still independent organizations. And the problem is in a way factored or distributed over these organizations. So it's parceled up and power is fractionated and those different agencies have different kinds of power. Um, and each of them can do different sorts of things. And they have parochial tendencies. They look after their own organization's needs or interests. Uh, so it's not as if they're looking after the interests primarily of the entirety, but often it's you know, the, the sub-organization's interests are paramount. So he suggests that goals aren't there, aren't devised centrally in some fashion or other, but they emerge um, as a set of constraints on action. So he regards them as constraints rather than objectives. Um, and they're attended to in some sequential fashion rather than in some collective manner, okay? And he says the options available are, tend to be those that are provided by the organizational routines. And that's okay, except that those routines are rarely tailored to a specific situation. They are standard operation procedures, so they're there for normal processes. And in a new situation, they may not be entirely appropriate. So they can be sluggish in their response. And he suggests that the aim of all of this, in fact, is to avoid uncertainty. So there's no maximizing or uh, utility function involved here. It's simply an avoidance of uncertainty. You'll notice, too, if you go back to the rational policy approach, the um, alternatives that were available there, if you look back at them, they're largely provided by the organizations involved. Um, the airstrike is probably there because the USA had an airstrike capability, it had an air force. The blockade was there because it had a, na a navy. The invasion was there because it has an army and can do such a thing. The political approach is there because it has um, a secretary of uh, department, the state department that can carry out that kind of maneuvering. So 
the alternatives in the first place, even though we thought they were rational, I mean, and they are rational, but even uh, they're, they're often there because that's what, that's, that's available through standard operating procedures. So you can see the overlap between the two there. His third approach is what he calls bureaucratic politics. And here he says that you're not really looking at organizations at all. You're looking at people, the central players, uh, the, the main people, the people who are in the XCOM uh, uh, committee at that point. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's decided by people. And here the, the, the power is shared or distributed among the people. Um, but the people need each other in order to make a decision they need, they, you know, to get their view across or their say in the, in the final outcome, they, they need the support of others. So the leader then is there, all right, possibly Jack Kennedy in this case, um, but largely as a first among equals rather than a supreme power. Okay, so uh, the leader negotiates along with everybody else and may have the final say or may have may make the call between two options, but they're there as one of the players as much as anything else. They're not they're not uh, they don't have a huge additional status. Uh, the key skills to, that are brought to bear are those of our political skills to persuade other people, to negotiate with other people, to build coalitions with people, to bring that uh, coalition outcome to others and try and convince them. So players, there's an emotional um, element here. It's not purely cognitive, it's not purely um, brain. It's, it's um, you know, people bring their emotions along, people fight for what they believe. And also it's not a single instance. This is usually part of an ongoing situation with multiple decisions from other previous battles, let's call it, or previous um, events. And there will be future events as well. And all of these overlap in time. So a bargain made last year and a coalition, coalition developed last year might inform the decision of a coalition made in this particular event. Um, who you helped last year, you might be able to draw support from them for this event, that sort of thing. And he says uh, deadlines force decisions. Uh, so it's critical to note that deadlines bring something to, you know, force something to happen. We're seeing it currently with Brexit, yet another deadline looming up that may cause a break in the impasse that's been there for the last year or so. Um, so uh, we we'll, won't know the outcome of that for another month or two, but um, there is a deadline and that may force a decision. And the outcomes. Um, they're a collage, they're a mixture of different sorts of things, not necessarily what any one person intended. So nobody may be happy with the outcome. Nobody may have devised a particular outcome. Nobody, nobody it may be even difficult to wonder where it came from because it came out of this political process of negotiation and bargaining. So the outcomes are a collage. And again, with Brexit, we're, we're likely to see the final outcome being some kind of a mixture of things that you know nobody particularly wanted, um, but it's the best solution that could come out of the process. So that's um, Alison's three models, and I think they're interesting because they they overlap. They they're, they're not it's not necessarily one or other model works. It's that all three are probably happening at the same kind of time, and their ways of viewing and making sense of what occurred. And um, now, decisions, particularly group decisions, can go wrong, and two of the ways they can go wrong are are come under the headings of escalation of commitment and groupthink. So escalation of commitment, first of all, and, and that's really a, a, a first uh, written about by uh, Stahl. Uh, you can see the reference there to um, Academy of Management Review 1981. Um, and he talks about a tendency of individuals to become locked into a course of action and commit more resources than are objectively warranted. In other words, the person, the decision makers in this case, are committing and carrying on with something that an outsider group may may not, may, may, may stop or may make a different decision. So it's likely to occur in situations where large sunk costs have been incurred or where a series of decisions have been made in a kind of a successive or incremental or a sequential fashion. <clears throat> For example, your career. Uh, you may take a first job, say you don't, you know, could happen to be a financial institution and a second job leads you further into financial institutions. And after a while, you're you become kind of locked into that uh, in the sense that you, you, your skills have developed there, you've got a good job or a good salary, good experience in it, and it can be very hard to get out of that. But you might have, after time, realized it wasn't where you really wanted to go, but you're kind of stuck there now. Um, so you, you, you've got yourself into that situation through a series of successive smaller steps, but ultimately they lead to a large gap. 
um, or indeed, as I say, the, or as, as Stoll says, the, where a large sunk cost is involved because you, you want to try and recoup that sunk cost in some way, so you keep going at it. Um, <clears throat> we obviously saw it in the Stalingrad case study where um, they, they kept pursuing that particular objective of taking that city when in really in reality was that they should have pulled back or changed course in some fashion or other, but they kept going the same fashion. Um, it arises due to some form of uh, retrospective justification or some kind of norm for consistency. Retrospective justification is where you, you continue with current actions to justify previous decisions or previous actions as much as to attain any future goals. So you attempt to try and turn the situation around to demonstrate the rationality of the original course of action. So it's a retrospective justification of a prior action. OK, as opposed to thinking what's best for the future. And the norm for consistency is that um, there's a, an impression that people have an impression that uh, consistency is uh, that it's important for leaders to be determined, to be consistent, to keep going, to, to not change their minds. And that can be due to, you know, a, a need to demonstrate competence to an external audience. And it was if you change your mind, it looks as though you're lacking in competence or it may be for your own self-esteem that um, uh, you, you don't like you you like to see something through for your own sake um, and Stahl suggests uh, counterbalancing this escalation tendency by a seeking outsider opinion somebody not involved talk to somebody outside who might be able to give you a more objective view than you might have yourself change or rotate decision makers again um, the person who's in, in the situation if you take that person out and put somebody else new in they may view it differently and they may take change course and not continue the way that was there before because the other person might be committed to it in a way that the new person may not. Shift focus away from the past actions and onto the future gain. So in a sense, disconnect from the past, accept your sunk cost and regard the future. Just put it aside and regard the future and, and do what's best for the future. And he suggests considering innovation rather than simply consistency. Um, Vermoulin and Sivanathan, um, a more recent paper, also, also look at this topic. Um, and they, again, look at why it happens and what we can do about it. So there's a strong overlap here, so I won't go through, through all the points. But essentially, they talk about a certain number of biases or blind spots that exist, that people just carry on because they, they don't realize that they're actually in a, they're, they're, they're suffering a bias or in a blind spot. So we've talked about some costs already. Loss aversion, we, we feel losses more keenly than we, than we um, perceive gains. So we don't like to lose things. So we hang on uh, to avoid losing something. Um, and that's, that's uh, Kahneman and Tversky's um, uh, theory that we feel losses more keenly and we try and avoid them. Illusion of control, uh, we think we can control the future, we can't, um, but there's a tendency, and the more powerful you are, the more that tendency may be there. We like to see things through, we have a preference for completion. There's also bystander behavior or what he calls, what they call pluralistic in ignorance. Um, the centers may stay quiet because A, they might think that, you know, um, actually everybody else is going with this and, you know, I'm not that keen, but I, I keep my voice to myself. Um, or that uh, the centers might be suppressed, which is more uh, more to do with groupthink than escalation, but it's a feat, it's the same element uh, that you dissent is kept down. Um, We've talked about personal identification already and selective information or confirmation bias. We, we, we pick data or information that suits our, suits our agenda and we avoid or we don't see or we don't look for data that might disconfirm it. And that allows us to carry on when in fact we may perhaps, perhaps we should reconsider. Um, so how can we reduce it? We talked about rules in the previous session and um, putting in place stopping rules or voting rules or starting rules is a way of, of um, preventing it. On Everest, they have a rule, I think it's two o'clock in the afternoon. If you haven't reached the summit by two o'clock in the afternoon, you turn around and you go back, you go down, you don't persist upwards after two or whatever the stopping time is. <clears throat> Protect the centres um, are indeed encouraged. Um, multiple points of view, encourage variety or um, diversity in the decision team um, and allow people pre uh, present a dissenting view. If you find people are stopping dissenting views from being aired, 
you may have to consider is there an escalation of commitment taking place here that we should be aware of. Explicitly consider alternatives. For example, if you're purchasing a house um, and you have a particular house in mind and you have a, there's a particular price in mind, um, it's useful to have a second house, maybe a slightly higher price, so that if the price of the one you're bidding on goes up beyond a certain point, now you might consider the alternative rather than just following it and keep following it up. It's only another thousand euro, whatever. Well, I'm, if I could afford 350,000, I can forward 351. But that keeps moving upwards and you need a stopping point. So having an alternative, another house at around 355 that, you know, if it goes up around there, you start considering the other house. And that gives you a, an alternative. Um, obviously, changing people, implementers from advocators. We, we talked about that already. And they suggest anticipating regret. In other words, putting yourself in into at some point into the future and looking back at what might have happened and seeing would that consider, would that make you change your mind? I've created a small model here based around this escalation of commitment. And there's two dimensions here, tendency to persist, which is in sort of an internal to do with yourself, the decision maker, and then likelihood of successful outcome. Um, which is an external consideration, which is to do with the environment, and low and high are the two anchor points in that, you know. And I just suggested four, this gives four quadrants, okay, and I'm la I've labelled the four quadrants there, as you can see. And the escalation one is really the, um, is where the tendency to persist is quite high, but the likelihood of success is low or decreasing as time goes on. And I've labeled that reckless or hero. Obviously, if it doesn't work out and the escalation is ill-founded, obviously you've been reckless. However, if it does work out, people can be regarded as the hero. You, you, you know, fought against all odds and you won out. And we've seen lots of movies made uh, uh, with this box in mind. And typically, uh, in Western movies anyway, the, the hero tends to win out. So it's the sport, the plucky sports star or the junior lawyer or whatever it is that somebody keeps working and keeps going against all the odds and wins out the hero. But the other side of that is the if it doesn't if you if you don't win out, if, if it doesn't work out successfully, it could be seen as reckless. Okay. And then obviously if the tendency if the likelihood is low, those people who minimize their tendency to persist might re be regarded as wise. They, they, they've seen the way the li land lies and they've, they've held back. On the other hand, the hesitator is one where they don't persist, but actually there's a high likelihood of achieving success. So I've labeled that the hesitator. And then clearly the achiever is the one where you persist, high, high tendency to persist and high likelihood of success. So I've labeled that the achiever. So that's just a model that you can look at the notion of escalation of commitment. Uh, I had a particular situation myself um, shortly after giving this lecture a few years ago um, where I visited my son in Wales and um, we decided we'd climb Mount Snowdon. And we started off, it was March, and we started off um, in, you know, reasonably sunny conditions, winter, but reasonably sunny. And we took the standard route up, which is following the railway tracks uh, to the summit of Snowdon. But as we went up, the weather got worse and uh, it started to snow. The ground started getting covered with snow. Um, after a point, uh, the railway tracks weren't so obvious anymore. Um, and at a certain point, we were about, you know, we, we were convincing ourselves that we were 20 minutes walk from the top. But in reality, we were probably 30 or 40 minutes from the top. And we at this point, my son took a photograph. So you can see the conditions we were working in here. And the tracks were almost covered over at this point and were to be covered over very shortly afterwards. And we had a little discussion and we decided, actually, let's stop and let's turn back and go down. This is the conditions are not good and we're not properly equipped for this. We didn't have snow gear um, crampons or ice axe or anything like that. And uh, we decided we turned down. So we did. But even that evening when we're sitting down over a drink, uh, discussing the day, we, we both felt, you know, really it would have been nice to get to the top of it and maybe we, we would have been able to. Um, so there is a real feeling of disappointment, you know, and loss when you do uh, not carry out something that maybe you could have done, but you're not sure. So the de-escalation isn't that easy to do. And so there's a real emotional involvement in keeping something going, trying it out, keeping going, one last push, maybe we'll get there. We just have to put in more effort, you know, try harder and all of that. Uh, so there's a, real, uh, there's a real sense of loss if it doesn't work out. So don't, don't minimize the, the escalation. 
so hence you have to be very careful of it and it takes a lot of effort to pull a project uh, I'll let you read this one yourselves um, a letter from under secretary of state to President Lyndon B. Johnson just prior to the Vietnam War. And you can see the, he states clearly the p possibility of escalation um, and a disaster that could ensue and in fact did ensue as we saw. Now groupthink, similar, uh, it's, it's not that dissimilar but it's more to do with the group phenomenon as opposed to the sunk cost phenomenon. And here it's uh, Janice who looked at it initially says group things start, or sorry, this is from to heart, but it's um, paraphrasing Janice's work. Uh, group things st uh, stands for an excessive form of current seeking among members of high prestige, tightly knit policy making groups, excessive to the extent that group members have come to value the group higher than anything else. And this causes them to strive for quick and painless unanimity on issues confronting the group. And to preserve this clubby atmosphere, group members suppress personal doubts, silence dissenters and follow the group leader's suggestions. So we had silence dissensions already in terms of escalation. Here it's more actively uh, pursued and even personal doubts are, are suppressed. Um, it's characterized by a strong belief in the internal morality of the group, combined with a decidedly evil picture of the group's opponents. And we saw that again in the Stalingrad case, where the, uh, where the German forces regarded the Russians as untermensch or um, subhuman. OK, they were um, stereotyping the opponents, and that's typical enough of a kind of group think approach. Results can be devastating distorted view of reality, excessive optimism, producing hasty and reckless policies and neglect of ethical issues. So it's quite a serious matter. Um, Chapman in her uh, article in 2006 um, discusses that um, and covers similar ground, um, but I, some, um, some points in addition to what um, Janice spoke about. Um, she defines it as when concurrence seeking emerges prematurely, thus curtailing thinking and discussion and increasing the likelihood of poor decision outcomes. So it doesn't have to be a clubby atmosphere or a high profile group or anything like that, just that where you're, when you come to a, a conclusion too early before you've fully thought it out. Okay. Um, and two antecedents, she says, um, there are two things that have to be in place for this to typically occur. A provocative situational context, so something usually that's dramatic or involving a moral dilemma or risk of loss, sunk costs, large sunk costs would be a, an example. And structurally antecedent conditions, and it was things that must be there in place beforehand. So a leader who is actively promoting their own solutions and not necessarily listening to anybody else. Where the group members are very homogenous. We've seen this before. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we've suggested that diversity is important in dealing with complexity. So when you have a very homogenous group of um, decision makers, it can lead to a group think type of approach. Lack of methodical decision making procedures. So again, if, if there's no votes taken or no form, no formal decision making approach, you can be led into a group think situation where the outcome is very much led in this case here by the, the leader and insulation from the opinions of other qualified people, okay? Symptoms are very much uh, the um, biases we've had earlier on, illusion of invulnerability, illusion of control. Um, and then we've had suppression of dissenters, uh, self-censorship, suppression of yourself, mind guarding, just blinkered view on approaches, and then outside factors, stereotyping of the outgroups and belief in morality of your own group. And her additional contribution here uh, in her paper is that she, she, she suggests that anxiety tends to increase the likelihood of group thinking occurring, occurring. So when the group are anxious, when there's an anxious or, a, you know, a, a risky situation where there's a lot of anxiety about, that increases the likelihood of group think according to Chapman. So that's the, the group think approach. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that point. Um, so there are two additional, we've had Alison's triple model, organizational processes, bureaucratic politics, as well as rational choice. And then we've had two uh, other concepts that tend to impede good decision-making escalation in the one hand and groupthink on the other, both of them very linked with biases and blind spots. So I leave it at that, thank you.